been so fiscally responsible over the past years. We have room to respond if there is no more to do. This is someone who's doubled our national debt. He's added more debt than all previous prime ministers combined. We know that people are struggling with the cost of food. And we know that the Liberal plan to ask CEOs nicely was a failure. We're in solution mode. We'll be, uh, I've been telling the CEOs to meet me in Ottawa next week. We're going to have a focus on home designs that are cost effective, labor efficient and energy efficient. Housing costs have doubled. Rent has doubled. The needed mortgage payment and down payment for a home have doubled. Welcome back to this special edition of Power Play. We're breaking down the top political stories of the year. Up next, you probably guessed, inflation and the climbing cost of living. Post-pandemic Canadians were hit with runaway inflation, reaching 8.1% in June of 2022, driving off the cost of pretty much everything and squeezing households tremendously. A problem the Bank of Canada promised to fix, but Governor Tiff Macklem warned that fix would hurt. Higher interest rates are painful but getting to 2% inflation is worth it. And I want to be clear, we are committed to the 2% target. In a move that started back in 2022, the bank quickly hiked rates from the pandemic low of 0.25% to the current 5%, and those hikes are starting to take hold. Inflation now sits at 3.1%, but as Macklemore, that drop has come at a price. The cost of a mortgage has skyrocketed. GB, GDP growth, pardon me, is stagnant at Beth and unemployment is ticking up. The front bench is back to talk about that. Brian Gallant, Lisa Raitt, Tom Mulcair, and Rob Benzi. Lisa, I'll start with you. Do you mm. think there is any more significant issue than the cost of living this year politically? No, I really don't. I mean, but who could predict, quite frankly? Who expected Ukraine? Who expected the terrorist attack in, right. in Israel? I mean, you can't really say never, but I'm going to say that it is the number one thing that people are talking about, um, especially around around the holiday season when people are working on budgets. And I think if we do see layoffs in the new year, I'm not saying that we are going to see them or not, but, um, you know, GDP is dropping, those small business loans are coming due. You may see some more people being laid off and, and out of work than before, and that's going to really hurt. And uh, housing prices and rents, it's its a tough world out there. And its it may be political to some, but for others, it's like existence. I think it's also, if you add to the list Lisa laid out, Brian, the millions of Canadians who will see their mortgages come up in the next year, mm -hmm. that I know for a fact from my conversations behind the scenes with people in the finance department, is like the overarching worry. If you combine an, an uptick in unemployment with that, those millions of people who will be faced with an, a really tough financial situation, uh, you have a recipe not only for, as Lisa points out, like even more anxiety, but a huge political impact too. For sure. And, and look, the people that are going to go in 2024 to renew their mortgages and, and see the new price tag, it, it's going to be very difficult, in some cases devastating. But, but also those that renewed in 2023, uh, they're going to continue to have payments that, that are much more <clears throat> significant than they were before. And every payment that they give, I mean, they, they may be able to make the first few or, or you know, the first maybe year or two and because of savings or because they were able to cut back. But every time that they have to make those payments at a, at a higher number, it, it becomes more difficult and more difficult for, for many households. So, so it's not even just the ones that are about to renew. It's the ones that have renewed. It's the ones that even if they're not going to renew in 2024, but they know it's coming, like it, it, it's just it's impacting so many people. So to your point, politically speaking, when you have an issue that is right at the heart of, of happiness and quality of life of people and so many people at the same time, it's very hard to think that it won't be, it won't continue to be the main political issue that the political parties need to address to think about and to, and to debate over. So, so to me, um, if we were guessing, I mean, the, the very sort of safe bet to predict what will be one of the driving forces of the political debate in 2024 will definitely be the cost of living, affordability, uh, housing, grocery okay. prices, the list goes on. Yeah, Brian, we got to save that for the next segment when you make your prediction. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Tom, Tom, I wanted to get your, your take on that as well. And especially if I think back a year ago to the way in which the government was addressing this issue, um, it was very much focused on targeted relief for people who were most hurting from inflation at the lower end of the income scale. That certainly evolved throughout the year with a clear recognition in the fall 
kind of pushed on by both opposition parties, to be fair to both the NDP and the Conservatives, that this was 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 hurting a broader swath of society, and therefore, like I said to, to Brian, a broader swath of, of society politically too. This is a huge bubble. I mean, this is a huge problem that we're looking at. And that's why people in the finance department, like the ones you're talking to, are identifying it as a potential huge problem just for the country as a whole, not just for the individuals and the families involved. But I also know that we were at 8.1 and now we're at 3.1. And Macklem seems to be really determined to get it down to two. And if all of a sudden people who are all being told, by the way, you know, take, take a mortgage that, that's variable, if they wind up getting it back to something that can be handled, that could change the political landscape as well, because Trudeau's patients might be paying off. The biggest problem Trudeau had during the summer, remember at the time of his cabinet shuffle, he held a press conference and he wouldn't admit that they had done anything wrong. He kept repeating mm -hmm. everything that they had done. But everything that they had done had not been sufficient for the average Canadian who was watching that. And he didn't seem to be, and it's rare, because Trudeau does have a way of being attuned to people. He seemed to be out of phase with what the average Canadian family was going through. But actually, one of the things that struck me was a figure that came out last week, $1,800. That's from 2022 to this year, for those two years, $1,800 more for the average family of, with two kids, it just in groceries. Where do you find the 1800 bucks on top, after taxes, on top of everything else that's gone up? That's the type of thing that Poitiers has zeroed in on. He's a bit late to the game, but Trudeau is starting to recognize it. But again, I think it's going to be very difficult for them unless interest rates start to come back down and the average family feels that they can get by. Canadians are heavily indebted. They live off credit cards. In the G20, we're among the most indebted. And that's only getting worse as the interest rates go up. Last word to you, Rob. Yeah, I mean, Tom makes a point. I mean, the only thing I would say anecdotally is... I, I, and maybe it's just because people are now so so uh, price tag battered, but I'm, I'm not hearing from friends and family about grocery prices as much as I was in the summertime or even, you know, uh, a few months ago around th before the Thanksgiving. Remember the great promise they were going to get prices down by Thanksgiving. I don't know if they did, but certainly the people that I'm talking to are not complaining quite as much as they were. Um, you know, gasoline prices here in Toronto today, uh, a, a litre of gas is $1.30. Uh, it was $1.40, $1.50 or, or, and more a few, a few uh, weeks ago. So on, you, you see some of those kinds of things, but it's very, very difficult to, once you're in this so, a sort of death spiral on affordability, as I think the Liberals are, uh, it's very hard to get out of it. I, I don't. I mean, mm -hmm. there's no magic bullet that government can do to 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 control. What, you know, a global inflation inflation crisis. Interest rates are high everywhere compared compared to what they were. That's the other thing. Is some context, Vashi. I mean, we talk about. Oh my gosh, they're you know five percent prime rate now. You know, talk to your dad. They, they and talk to my dad. It was you know fifteen, sixteen percent when they were doing mortgages in the 1980s. So I think. But we've been seduced by these low rates for so long. The most I ever paid on a mortgage in 1999 was 5.75%. And my father was like, you don't know how lucky you are. And I, th and I thought I was lucky. Right. And, and, I, and I am lucky compared to people now. Although the, the, mm. the, the prime voting block of millennials like myself, Rob, yep. are among those who are unaccustomed to it and therefore yes. have a different context and might <laughs> might inform their political uh, viewpoint differently, too. 